Chancellor of the University, Professor Dr. S. Gauri. The Professor and Head of the Department of Legal Studies, Dr. B. Venugopal, who delivered the welcome address. Dr. Helamalai, the Registrar. Thiru G. Balachandran, IAS, former Additional Chief Secretary of the Government of West Bengal. Distinguished guests, including Justice Akbar Ali. Assistant Professor Dr. G. Raj Shekhar, who is due to deliver the word of thanks. And most importantly, delegates, faculty, students from University of Madras and all over who have come here to attend this um, two-day seminar. Let me first welcome all of you and thank the organizers for inviting me to this very important uh, seminar. Just as a matter of importance uh, or uh, in a university context, I must first validate or clarify some facts among the earlier speakers. In fact, last year we reduced the revenue deficit by 16,000 crores, not 7,000 crores, so it was a much bigger number. This year I think we'll do even better than that. So we are on track under the leadership of our Chief Minister to make significant progress in very short time. I also want to talk a little bit about this notion of rescuing universities. Uh, I have studied organizational theory, human psychology in multiple places. And I believe that alignment of incentives and the design of organizations, structures, uh, accountability, evaluation, performance incentivization, these are all very important. Without these, we cannot get good outcomes. In that sense, one of my big concerns has been whether it is public sector enterprises under the BPE or universities that are autonomous by design because we want to keep academics independent of interference from the administration. We often find that autonomy works as a one-way street. So all decision-making, hiring, paying, uh, investment, etc. is done autonomously. And when financial troubles hit, all of a sudden, the government is the bailout for all these entities. So I have been very clear. I am all for autonomy, as long as it is a two-way street. If you run independently, whether that is uh, public sector enterprises or any other place, in a way that you take care of your own finances, we don't want to interfere in your functioning. It is only appropriate that academia, that enterprises should be a part of politics and uh, governments have a tendency to swing towards politics. But if you require funding from the government, then the government is going to ask you some questions that might be uncomfortable about ratios of expenditure towards what they're intended and so forth. I don't want to get too far into the detail, but I would say that as the Vice Chancellor here knows, we've already made significant progress last year in some one-time one, uh, one settlements. We are happy to do what we have to do as long as responsibility flows in both directions. And so we'll do the right thing. Okay. The other thing, a minor thing I want to say is that like the professor, I too had a PR in uh, Singapore. I also had a green card in the US. I gave up both of those to come back. So uh, I'm definitely a returnee at some level. Now I want to make a very, very important distinction uh, or a clarification from Mr. Balachandran's statement. The notion of social justice far predates uh, Periyar's involvement starting with the self-respect movement and into the DK. When the Justice Party government was formed in 1921, Periyar was a member of the Congress. When the legislation for women to have the right to vote was introduced and passed, when compulsory elementary education for boys and girls was introduced and passed, when the communal GO was introduced and passed for caste reservation, all those were done by the Justice Party prior to Periyar leaving the Congress. So we must not remember, I must not, not forget that there were crusaders 
that were long before the self-respect movement working on social justice. Anyway, with those corrections, um, let me talk a little bit on the subject at hand. Democracy and social justice, two distinct but correlated in multiple ways notions. The notion of democracy, in my mind, is at its core, one person, one vote, equality. That is, that every person has equal say in determining the direction of the collective of all people that is formed into a republic, a country. In that sense, democracy actually uh, has some strengths and some weaknesses. Its key strength by design is to allow and yet mitigate a capitalist economy or a free market. It allows it by having rules and regulations and ensuring that markets can function without excessive interference or, um, you know, uh, cartelization or uh, capture. But it should work in such a way that it doesn't allow the benefits to go to so few that the Karl Marx view of the world, where the returns to capital become higher and higher and higher, and the returns to labor become lower and lower and lower, to the point where the social structure is broken and you have blood on the streets revolution because the workers at the bottom of the pyramid revolt against getting less and less of the share. So, I think the problem of executing the vision of democracy in any uh, country through the constitution, most constitutions are fantastically well designed, but when it comes to execution, scale gets in the way. If you think about it, um, one man, one vote works, or one person, one vote works very well when we go down to the council elections and we have about 1,000 or 2,000 voters per every councillor. Truly, the accountability of the elected to the electorate is real, is tangible. You get to something like an MLA and now you have about two and a half lakh voters for every representative. The direct connect is not that strong. The ability for any one individual to hold an elected representative accountable is not that high. And in fact, the um, ability to influence the outcome through mass media and other communication becomes more important or becomes higher. So you start to see the breakdown of this notion of the relationship and accountability between the elected and the electorate. And then of course you go to something like a Lok Sabha seat or large scale democracy where you have in Tamil Nadu about one and a half million people, 15 lakh people elect an MP. And now that, uh, that link is completely broken and the party system and propaganda, all of this starts getting in the way of true democracy. But in design, democracy is intended, let us be very clear, to increase equality, to ensure accountability, and to give every person equal treatment uh, in many aspects, in every aspect. What about social justice? What actually defines a society and what do we consider justice? As uh, many people pointed out, particularly Mr. Balchandran pointed out, at different times the dividing line of who is above and who is below the line of equality has changed. If you look at societies like the United States, at one time it was about religion or Western Europe, who was a Catholic versus who was a Protestant, there was discrimination. If you look at, uh, at different points, it was about race, who was of African origin or who was of Caucasian origin. At other points in other societies, it was about class, who was of the working class and who was of the landed or the noble class, as they called it then. In our case, in Tamil Nadu, it has been long about caste or community, who are forward caste, who are backward, who are oppressed, uh, who are scheduled, and so forth. 
But social justice has been at the core of politics at least for a hundred years, more than a hundred years, in the land where we stand today. So going back to the formation of the South Indian Liberal Federation in 1916, at which my great-granduncle was one of the signatories and funders of the movement um, and shareholders by buying shares in the society. It is beyond debate that I would say, though different parties have managed the government, have been elected to run the government of Madras Presidency, then Madras State, then divided Madras State after Andhra was taken out, uh, separated, and then the state of Tamil Nadu. Throughout this hundred years or hundred plus years, since the 1921 first Justice Party government after the Montague transfer reforms, social justice has been either at the core of or somewhat respected by the governments that have run, uh, that have administered this region, the place where we stand today. So much so that even the Justice, uh, the Congress Party or the uh, Swatantra or coalition governments that um, came to ruling power, administrative power between 1937 and 1967, adhered much more closely to the Dravidian philosophy, to the social justice philosophy, than they did to the Congress's philosophy across the rest of India. For example, uh, temple nationalization of the kings and uh, historic temples was done by the Justice Party uh, in Thiru Rajaji's time and then in Thiru Bhakta Ochanam's time that was doubled up, that the Dalit Temple Entry Act was signed, that Archana is being said in Tamil was promoted and legalized and so forth. The Justice Party legislated compulsory elementary education for boys and girls in 1921. The emphasis on education was only expanded further uh, in the time of Thiru Kamaraj in terms of buildings of schools and expanding the noon meal program originated in Madras Corporation to the state of Tamil Nadu or the state of Madras as it was then known. So in almost every way we look, the Congress party of this part of the world adhered to the values because they were such profoundly successful and impactful values in the notion of social justice. I want to talk a little bit about the controversies or the complexities rather than the controversies in the notion of social justice. But before I do that, I just want to mark this point in time. There are many models of development. There are even potentially many models of democracy. There are organizations that rate democracies as a fully functional democracy, as a semi-functional democracy, as a kind of autocracy or, or then worse than that. But as far as India is concerned, the constitution is the same. We all operate under the same constitution. And uh, the union government is enormously powerful under the design of that constitution. Maybe rightly so. Maybe it's past its uh, validity in terms of the concentration of power. Maybe we need a lot of amendments to, to empower states and regions more. But at the inception, though the constitution says that India is a union of states, in fact, the power resides largely with the union and has increased towards the union. Another discussion for another day. But within such a structure where the union is almost all powerful, let us look at the contrast between three states. A poor state relatively like Bihar and two relatively rich states like Tamil Nadu and Gujarat. If you look at Bihar and Tamil Nadu, the distinction is very, very clear. The average age in Bihar is about 20 years old, in Tamil Nadu it's about 34, 35. That's because the total fertility rate in Bihar is still north of 3, in Tamil Nadu it's only 1.6. The average education in Bihar is elementary school dropout, in Tamil Nadu is high school graduate. The per capita income in Bihar is about 50 or 60,000 rupees below the national average of 134. In Tamil Nadu it's more than double at 280 or 290. So we have had profoundly different outcomes between rich and poor states. The gross enrollment ratio into tertiary education is 53% in Tamil Nadu, is probably 12 or 14% in Bihar. But what about comparing rich states 
Does it mean that all rich states develop the same way? Has there been equal social justice or other forms of justice or equity in rich states? If you compare Gujarat and Tamil Nadu, we are both roughly 11% of the nation's manufacturing. Tamil Nadu is slightly higher percentage of the total GDP, but because the population is higher here, the per capita GDP, Gujarat is slightly higher than us. We're both double the national average. But economically, we're kind of roughly in the same place at the aggregate. But if you delve into the details, we are vastly different states. The poverty rate in Tamil Nadu is under 4%. In Gujarat, is almost four times that. The percentage of 18-year-old girls that have completed high school or, or are completing high school in Tamil Nadu is about 85%. In Gujarat, it's about 50%. The number of doctors per thousand people in Tamil Nadu is four. In Gujarat, it's one. The number of factories is much higher. The number of people engaged in those kinds of jobs is much higher as a percentage of the population. So what we have is two completely different societies in terms of social justice or economic outcomes at a per capita level. At aggregate level, they look the same. That's what 100 years of social justice or not having 100 years of social justice yields in the outcome. So that's something we must remember. Now, let's look at some more complicated issues. This notion of reservations, which as I said, was first introduced back in the early 1920s by the Justice Party, seminal legislation. And what it said is that jobs will be reserved for candidates coming from certain communities based on the population proportion. So if you're 3% of the population, you get 3% of jobs, not 65% of the jobs as the data showed at that time. Now. At the time, and even today, if you go to places like the US, they say affirmative action is okay, but quotas are not okay. We basically legislated quotas. That's what reservation is. What is the argument against reservation or against quotas? It is that in the short term, it is inefficient. Completely agree. For example, if you only introduce compulsory elementary education to all communities in 1920 or 21, Surely, if you start reserving 35% of the jobs for this community or 20% of the jobs for that community, there are not enough people of that community who have qualified to do that job because they have not had the opportunity to get education. But the whole point is that in the long term, what it does is that it builds an inclusive society because the greatest facilitator or enabler of people being able to reach certain positions, whether it's a job in the government or a private enterprise or a university, is having a forerunner, is having a munudarnam, having somebody who has been there, done that, from your community, from your village, from your town, who can tell you how it is done, how the ropes are laid, what the system is, and how you should apply and where you should go. If you look around the world, this is true even today. Ivy League schools will always take their students from certain high school or universities because there's a pipeline. They say, oh, I know this fellow, this fellow knows that fellow. I'll tell my junior, he'll tell his junior, she'll tell her junior, so on. So this ability to create coattails, to create a pipeline, to create a, a guide is in the long term so valuable that we don't mind having inefficiency societally. Of course, there will be individuals who will say, I'm super qualified. But because you constrained the quota for my community, I did not get this job. This individual is not so qualified. But because you gave some quota for that community, and there are not enough qualified people in that community, therefore that person is going to get a job. Individually, I am more qualified than that person. But if we don't make the change today, for 50 years there will be a continuance of those who are qualified and have a guide and have a pathway and have an uh, example to guide them. And those who don't have something like that will never be able to break through. So even though there are arguments to be made that reservations and hard quotas are inefficient in the short term, that is the price we are willing to pay policy-wise, government-wise, administration-wise for the long-term benefits of making a system truly inclusive. So I, in my mind, that's not really a controversy anymore. Another area where we get a lot of kind of pushback or a lot of uh, sloganeering is that somehow measurement is a bad thing. 
measurement is against social justice. No, no, you cannot put a meter on my power. No, no, you cannot put a meter on my water because it is the slippery slope that is going to uh, lead to charging tomorrow or it is going to create some negative impact in the future. Actually, we need to step back a little bit, right? If we want to look at justice, the classic symbol of justice is the lady of justice who is blindfolded and holds the scales in her hand. The notion being that in the eyes of the law, everybody should be equal. That's the equivalent to being blindfolded. I can't see who is approaching me with a case. I should treat them equally, irrespective of who the individual is. In fact, I would argue the other way that as far as the law is concerned and the judicial system is concerned, any country where people can play their privilege rather than get level treatment is not really a democracy, is not really a country under the rule of law. But the problem is if we continue that kind of model into social and economic justice, now we start running into trouble. So, if you look at the symbol of the Justice Party, it was not the lady holding the scales, it was just the scales. Because if you want the scales to balance, you can be blind if you assume that two people approaching the system for judgment have equal opportunity, equal access, equal standing. You don't want one to be powerful and one to be weak. If they are equal standing, then they get equal outcomes. But we know that's not true in our society. In our society, we have had oppression of certain communities and castes for hundreds or thousands of years. Some people have been at the top, some people have been in the middle, some people have been at the, uh, the bottom. So the only way we can provide a justice in terms of outcomes is to give, as Guru Balakrishnan pointed out, reservations and uh, unequal treatment to those who have been historically oppressed to bring the scales back into balance. If we are going to do that, of course we need to know who they are. We need to be able to identify. That's why in the admission system, whether it is in colleges or in universities or in government jobs, we ask for a community certificate. Because you need to know who it is to decide how you bring the system back into balance, how the scales can be brought back into balance. I will now extend that to economic justice. This notion that somehow measurement of utilization or measurement of consumption is against the notion of social justice, in my mind, is a propaganda against actual justice in outcomes. Why should it be that somebody who uses 10,000 units of power should get the same subsidy as somebody who uses 200 units of power? It doesn't make sense. That's why we have meters to measure electricity. Why shouldn't that principle also apply to water or other things? Why shouldn't it also apply to property taxes? So, actually knowing who uses what, knowing who gets what, is at the core of providing economic justice. That is why progressive taxation like income taxes, where we set the slab based on what we know to be your income, are much more equitable and fair than regressive taxes like petrol or diesel taxes or GST, where it's a point of sale tax that gets passed on to the consumer, but we have no way of knowing who is consuming how much. We know they must be regressive by design because poorer and middle class people spend much more of their income or wealth on taxable goods and services than rich people. Rich people, I can, if, I, if I'm 100 times richer than a poor person, I cannot eat 100 times more. So, then I have money left over to do things like investments in real estate and art and the stock market and other things. So, if you look at the proportion of total income spent on taxable goods and services, poor people, middle class people spend much more of it. And if the rate of taxation in GST is flat or petrol is flat at 18 or 15 or 12 or 20, then poorer people end up paying a much higher effective tax rate. This is an argument I've been making for a long time and I hope many of you have seen the Oxfam report that came out last week where they have quantified it and said that the bottom of the pyramid pays 65% of all GST and that the top 10% pay a very, very small portion, right? That's, that's what you would expect theoretically in economics and now the data validates that. So if you have blind taxes like GST where we don't know who we are taking it from, you are going to get unfair outcomes. 
and you have line of sight taxes like income taxes, then you can rate, raise the rates progressively and say if you're below this much, no tax. If you're above that much, 40% tax or 60% tax and therefore make it equitable. So though these are sometimes seen as controversial issues and very often they are used as propaganda by those benefiting from unfair outcomes, in fact we have to keep a clear distinction that justice before the law requires the lady to be blindfolded, the lady of justice to be blindfolded. But justice in other measures, whether it's social justice or economic justice, requires increasingly greater clarity of the person standing before the scale asking for justice, only then we can actually ensure justice in the outcome. Having said that, uh, let me mention that I think this is such an important seminar. In the world we live in today, where propaganda seems to fill the waves, and not enough light or debate happens. It is uh, hugely encouraging that the University of Madras, following in the great tradition of a century-old university, and in the land of social justice in this Tamil Man, is the right host and the right location for such a seminar. I wish you a couple of days of both enlightening and enjoyable discussions. I urge all the young people here to absorb this debate, to question it vigorously. But then if you are convinced about the values, about what is right, about what is fair, that you must become ambassadors of social justice. And as it's, I would say that much has been done in the last hundred years, much still remains to be done. And the hope of any society rests on the young, the future leaders of this country. And I have no doubt that as everything is temporary, so also the situation of relatively mindless propaganda driving politics is a passing phase because I have great faith in the youth, great faith in education, great faith in your ability to remove the noise and see the light. And so I wish you all the very best. I thank you for coming uh, and I'll take my leave.